Good evening, everybody. Um, I am Betsy Fisher Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute here at American University. And welcome to our virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. Uh, we're glad that you could uh, join us this evening. If you are new to one of our events, uh, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs. And we aim to close the gender gap in political leadership. Uh, and offer academic and practical campaign training. Uh, and we facilitate research and discuss in, discussions like this on women in politics and leadership. So tonight, we are excited to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth Griffiths, who explores the history of American women and the rights they have sought to secure in her new book entitled, Formidable American Women and the Fight for Equality. Uh, Dr. Griffith earned her PhD right here at American University and she's taught courses on women's history and spent many years as head of school at Madeira nearby in McLean, Virginia. Uh, she is also the author of In Her Own Right, The Life of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, and so we're delighted that she could be with us this evening to talk about um, her book and uh, American history of women and equality. So I want to let you all know before um, we get going that we're going to save plenty of time for questions. Uh, so at the bottom of your screen, you will note the uh, ask a question Q&A button. So during the course of our discussion, please feel free to type in a question and we'll save time for that at the end. So with that, Elizabeth, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm delighted. I'm a fan of yours. <laughs> well, we're so glad that you could be with us and congratulations again on the book. We spent a lot of time, as you probably know, in 2020, really celebrating and marking the centennial of women's suffrage. And we know that the fight for women's equality did not end on that August 26, 1920, right? There's many, many more chapters to be written, which you've captured here. <laughs> um, and I know there's many chapters yet to come. So Give us a sense of what you did set out to chronicle in this book um, as you really examine those 100 years uh, since suffrage. With all the attention on the centennial of mm -hmm. the 19th Amendment, I asked what happened next? What yeah. were women doing with voting rights? And I wanted to ask not just about white women, but about white and black women. And as the book progresses, other um, cohorts of American women, we are so diverse and we have so many interests, some competing and some not, um, some were able to um, come together on. So the 19th amendment was an incomplete victory in two ways. It enfranchised 26 million women. It doubled, more than doubled the size of the electorate but it did not include Native American women, Asian immigrants, mm -hmm. um, women who lived in the territories or the District of Columbia, and it did nothing to protect the rights of Black women who were enfranchised, but then the majority in 1920 were living in Southern states with um, racist uh, voting rules, exclusionary voting rules, the same that Black men had confronted. So you have um, technically, uh, 26 million women having the vote, and they do not rush to the polls. Um, there is uh, the lowest turnout in American presidential history since mm -hmm. 1820. And for two reasons, I think. Um, white women had internalized all the negative messages about why women should not vote. They, it was inappropriate for them to be in the political arena. They knew nothing about politics. They were well represented by fathers or husbands or brothers. And if husbands didn't want them to vote, they were not voting. For immigrant women, there were language issues. For poor women, the poll tax applied, um, where the poll tax existed, it applied to all poor people as a discriminatory action. So clearly some white women voted, but again, um, clearly not very many. And just to add a footnote to that, nobody was counting. There were no exit polls. There was right, no exactly. Center, no center for the American women in politics tracking every cohort of American women. Right, yeah. Black women, in contrast, were very eager to vote and were in, um, encouraged by their families and their communities to vote, but they confronted this uh, really terrifying and violent resistance. A journalist in 1930 will say that the 19th Amendment promised almost everything and accomplished almost nothing. And uh. sadly, sadly, that's you could say that was true. 
Well, when, there's a, a funny quote that you have in the book from a, a New York City cop to a reporter after uh, women were given the right to vote. And he said, it ain't like it used to be since women's been mixing in politics ain't the same, <laughs> right? So, And in many ways, they even changed the polling booths. So prior yeah. to women voting, men voted in saloons and in barbershops where they could swear and spit and drink and smoke. And so in 1920, to um, make... Uh, voting vo polling booths acceptable to women. They moved to schools and fire stations and libraries, the practice we have today. No smoking, no drinking, no spitting, no swearing. And, um, and the Girl Scouts offered to babysit nationwide, um, but um, men were not pleased by that change. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, the issue of diversity and race, and um, I just wanna explore that a little bit more with you because you were able to sort of um, write about those interconnections between the two, between the equal rights movement and the civil rights movement and how they were kind of woven together, sometimes on parallel tracks, sometimes intersecting. Give us a sense just as we come in past suffrage, the trajectory that each of those took. Less frequently working together yeah. um, in, the, in the hundred years that we've covered in this book. So white and black women had different agendas and different strategies. White women, Democrats were very engaged in immigrant rights, factory women's rights, social justice issues, founding the ACLU, um, sort of using government to solve problems. A lot of Republicans followed Alice Paul and supported the Equal Rights Amendment, creating a partisan division between former suffragists. Um, and they could do all of those things in public. They could lobby, they could run for office, they could be politically engaged in public with no risk to their lives. Mm -hmm. Black women had a much broader agenda. It included black men and women. They were really in it to protect their entire communities, principally from lynching and racial violence, then from Jim Crow discrimination, then from all the differences in um, the lives of black and white people in a deeply segregated um, country where shabby schools, poor sewage systems, no playgrounds. They wanted to repair all those things. Um, so, but it was dangerous for black women to do any of those things. So they worked underground. They worked out of church basements. They worked as agricultural agents. They worked um, as public health nurses, as teachers, just as neighbors, trying to organize their communities, how to read, how to vote. Um, how to know enough about the constitution to pass the discriminatory literacy tests. And then they would get braver and bolder um, in the fifties. They also, whereas white men, white women were eager to confront white men and say, we're as good as you are publicly. Mm -hmm. Black women were more subtle and realized that um, black men had been emasculated by Jim Crow. So they were eager to have black ministers, black politicians in the forefront, and they were glad to be in the background until the late 50s and 60s. And then they thought, these ministers are not doing all that good a job. We could do as good a job of this, so we'll be um, more public and more active. But in my um, opinion, um, black women stick to the fight longer. They are better at coalition building, and they are braver because they had to confront such terrifying circumstances. And you talk about that coalition building and sort of staying in the fight. Um, there was this divisiveness, I guess, and you write about this um, in terms of, you know, the women, different fractions of, um, you know, of course we know about, you know, before the ERA, I mean, excuse me, before suffrage was passed, the different two different camps, right? <laughs> and then that, that, didn't, that didn't stop afterwards either. There was still sort of two ways of thinking about um, how to, how to uh, attain more rights. Two different camps between the two major suffragist organizations, yeah. the National American Women Suffrage Association, Carrie Chapman Catt, probably right. one of the most brilliant political strategists in American history. And then Alice Paul, the militant street theater organizer, so brilliant at pickets and parades. Um, but, and one of the reasons Kat, I, I give Kat, Kat majority credit for the vote counting and the strategy to get it through the Congress and then ratification. But for the last, from 1917 on when New York passed until it passed, until the amendment concludes and is added to the constitution in August of 1920, Kat has held together a multiracial, multiethnic age range 
national two-tier campaign, very sophisticated campaign. But everybody who wanted suffrage, everybody who was in that fight was in it for self, a, a matter of self-interest. There were social workers, there were factory workers, there were Jewish women, there were immigrant women, there were wealthy women. Everybody had their own agenda. Um, and then you really need to put in the third force of black women. They were not as included in either of those organizations, although Kat was more open than Paul. And there was deep rooted distrust coming out of the, um, of the early suffrage organizations in um, the 1870s. Um, so there, there's lots of reasons for black women to distrust white women, but they participate because it's in their self-interest to get the vote as well. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, the research that you did for the book. Um, you've been teaching um, women's history, um, but yet you uncovered some, some new things along the way. And, and where did you do your research? And um, what's surprising that did you learn? What, well, Unlike, unlike my Elizabeth Cady Stanton book, which was yeah. dissertation at AU, which relied entirely on primary research. I dug around dusty historic societies and in basements of ancient churches in upstate New York. It was fun. The detective work yeah. was fun. <laughs> but this book, this book has a different um, research base. I really depended a lot on secondary sources because so mm -hmm. many scholars have taken on this topic in little bits. Right. What was happening to women in the 20s or the 30s or who was Rosie the Riveter or what was happening to Jewish refugees or what's going on with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So I relied on very notable, sophisticated university scholars without whose publications or monographs um, I um, would have been bereft. And then in more recent times where the books haven't been written yet, I really depended on um, newspaper sources. I tried to always find as a former teacher, two sources for every fact um, so that I could support it. Um, even, with a, even with a PhD and a deep background in teaching, I uh, was learning all the time. I certainly knew the names of some of these African-American heroines, but I did not know the, the depth of their story. I did not know the sacrifices and the detail or the horror that they were told. Um, and I think that's a lesson for everybody. I now I used to I've taught every age um, in my career, and more recently I'm teaching adults. Uh, and there's huge interest in what we weren't, what we didn't learn when we were exactly. in college. Yeah. And with American politics changing so rapidly, with the polarization and the racial issues, there's a hunger to learn more about how we got here and how we can fix it. And of course, historians always think you just read a lot of history and you'll have a better perspective on the solutions. <laughs> Do you think, though, as someone who was an administrator, uh, you know, at the high school level, do you think that that's much improved now that young women now are learning more about women's history uh, in the middle school and high school? Because we had like maybe two pages in my textbook. I, think. Um, I remember uh, not even recognizing that Jacksonian democracy got a whole chapter when it only enfranchised you know, white men so right. didn't own property and suffrage, the whole half of the population not mentioned in anything that I studied. Um, I do think, I think the curriculum are improving across the board and not only in girls schools like the one I headed. Um, you can judge in part by the questions asked on advanced placement history exams. Mm. I remember when a question about suffrage was first introduced maybe 25 years ago and heads of boys' school said, wait, what, what, what? You're asking about women's history as though that were not a huge event, the 19th Amendment. It's like, you know, don't you know about the Voting Rights Act? You need to know these things. Um, so I, 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 have, I am up until recent fights in school boards about what um, curriculum ought to be and what books right. ought to be in libraries. I had quite a lot of confidence in the good work done by teachers, age appropriate work at every level. Because um, American history, I mean, one of the reasons I'm a historian is I love storytelling and it's filled uh -huh. with stories right. of villains and heroes and heroines. Um, uh, and we need to know all of that. I'm not for, um, I'm for making people uncomfortable. They need to know, American young people need to know the history of our country, the good and the bad. And then they need to learn 
from fact-based background, how to think critically and make decisions and um, defend their point of view, whatever it is. And even when you were getting your PhD in history, you ended up doing your, as you mentioned, your dissertation on Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That must have been, what's she doing there, right? <laughs> From your it was, fellow. It was viewed as an unusual topic, but that's really yeah. how American history, how women's history got started. When um, at the end of the 60s, the government got rid of graduate deferment. So a lot of men who might have been taking up seats in PhD programs got drafted. Women began filling those seats. And whenever um, graduate students are asked to write a dissertation, they clearly have to use to um, primary research, but they'll follow a field that they're interested in. So when right. the GI Bill sent lots of um, non-elite Americans to graduate school, you had the history of immigration and urbanization and industrialization and farmers. You had a lot of history being written by white men and then graduate schools open to black men and you begin to get black history and then finally mm -hmm. women writing all mm -hmm. kinds of history and you can almost follow the development of new fields of history by every new immigrant group or every group who feels that it now has a voice lgbtq gender studies all those things are now yeah. found in university catalogs that would not have appeared um, 50 years ago well, in, in speaking of sort of like that post-war time, you, you write about, you know, women as candidates, and certainly it took a very long time for women to be elected to public office, especially, as they say, in their own right, right, not succeeding, succeeding their husbands who had passed away, right, um, but you also write kind of post-war, very few women, you know, even though, you know, women were involved in so many areas of you know, work during the war, um, for them to be in entering politics, you write about that it was seen as sort of a threat to post-war stability, that kind of gender and sexuality component. It certainly was. Two, two elements there, Betsy. The first is that um, America becomes an unexpected world power, mm -hmm. that, um, the threat of communism around the world. And so we become quite... Um, interested in, in national security, the whole McCarthy era, the, the communist hunting, the gay hunting, mm -hmm. um, the sense that women should all retire to suburbs and have lots of babies and that the nuclear family really demonstrates the strength of America. There's a flaw in that because from the time Rosie was laid off at the end of the Second World War, the number of women in, America, in the American workforce has only increased. It has never decreased since 1946. So even though the image is of white women at home having lots of babies, there were plenty of white and black women working. Women in politics, it is still into the late 40s, not very many women have served or if they have served, they haven't served long enough to accrue seniority. Right. Um, there are three who do, um, and but the rest are one or two year terms. In defense of widows, speaking as a widow, yes. a lot of those widows were really well prepared. Margaret mm -hmm. Chase Smith comes in. Margaret Chase Smith succeeds her ne'er-do-well husband who dies of syphilis in 1940. And in every election to the House, she earns, she wins more votes than he ever did. And then she runs for the Senate, the first woman to serve in both the House and the Senate. And then she gives that brilliant speech attacking McCarthy for his um, insults to America and his horrible behavior, um, his bullying. Um, so she's an example, and there are many. I mean, Lindy Boggs is another. I, you would know the statistic better than I. I'm not sure I'm recalling it correctly, but I think until the year 2000, the majority of all the women who had served in the House and the Senate entered as widows. But oh, that, yeah. That doesn't mean they weren't reelected in their own right and exactly, serve exactly. long terms. Very hard to run, run for office in America if you are female because political parties are controlled pretty much by men. And if there's an open seat, they are not going to automatically give it to a woman. So you have to win a primary, which right. can be tough, um, expensive. Running for anything that's far from home is daunting because you have to move your family. Although most of the women who've run, the age of women running for office has dropped dramatically from in every decade until the current decade where you have women with young children now running for office, pregnant women running for office. Um, there yeah, was, that was not that was hardly ever done. I mean, never, that was, never done. Yeah. These were these were women who didn't run until they were 50, 60, 65. Millicent Fenwick is a good example. She'd been head of Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi as yeah. well. 
Yes, yes, indeed. Although enough raised that with my children until she ran. <laughs> right. She doesn't run till she's 47. And there too is, is uh, someone has died and she's been appointed. She's not the widow, but she right. gets a seat. Right. Um, but if you're, if you're not beginning to run until you're in your late 50, late 40s or 50s, and you're running right. for the House, then it's unlikely you're going to run for the Senate or accrue enough power and enough, have enough time to become a committee chair or a leader. That's begun to change quite dramatically, um, uh, really sort of beginning in the surge of, of that followed Anita Hill, the, the 1992 year of the women, which was only the addition, yeah. only the addition of four senators, but it was big at the time. <laughs> um, uh, but, but more and more women are running, but the statistics are uh, discouraging. And, and sort of the evolution, um, you know, uh, at the Institute, we have a campaign training program called We Lead, where we um, teach young women to um, give them the skills to run for office. Nothing new that um, there's plenty of organizations that do that. Uh, but it is relatively new over the last, I don't know, what would you say, 25, 30 years? Um, and how important do you think it, that notion is about, um, you know, equipping women with the skills and the confidence to run? And then, you know, what we see now, too, is more and more women being supported, groups like Emily's List becoming a powerhouse and, and funding some of those campaigns. Um, and, and do you attribute that in, um, you know, to women being successful, uh, especially maybe younger women? I think it's really hard to run for office. And I think yeah. any organization, yours, Emily's List, others, who can say to women, you can do this. I think that's the first important message to have a mentor who says, you're as capable of doing this as somebody else. I remember years ago, we used to joke that um, 25 year old men look in the mirror and whistle hail to the chief and imagine themselves in the Oval Office. <laughs> and 25 year old women who might think about running for Congress as they're old enough then say to themselves, oh, I'm not qualified yet. I need to do five more things before I'm qualified to run. Um, women need to know that they are clearly capable of doing this. Some uh, Liz Carpenter from the Johnson administration would say that we'll know we've really succeeded when there are as many mediocre women in Congress as there are mediocre men. But there are superior women in Congress and um, <laughs> they've all proved their worth. None, I, I want to go back to the statistics because this is discouraging to me. We have been, women have had the vote and been political actors since 1920. Today, we are more than half of the population. We uh, are registered at larger numbers. We turn out at larger numbers. We vote, we make a difference. Particularly right. ironic to me, of course, is the power of the black women's vote, not allowed in 1920 and now changing results in 2020. The highest number of women in any sort of governing body in America is at the student government level in colleges and it's 44%. It drops down to 34% for school boards, which is basically the lowest level for which you sort of have authority, city council, school boards. And women run for that because they know the issues and you don't have to leave home. You don't have to disrupt your children and it doesn't cost a lot of money. After that, the state legislature, also pretty easy to do. We are 29% of the state legislature, 27% of the current Congress, 23 senators, so 23%, nine governors, and 100 years, that's really slow progress toward any kind of true representation or um, staying power where you're chairing committees and controlling um, leadership. Although huge that Nancy Pelosi is the speaker and that we have yeah. a female vice president. Right, exactly. Well, and you mentioned progress. You, you, you touch in the book, uh, um, uh, these various touch points in history that have been sort of revolutionary for women. Um, not just it, not just politically speaking, but even the issue of birth control you write about and how when that was approved by the FDA, it did really revolutionize women's lives in society. Um, even though when it was first approved, it was only available to married women. Um, talk not in about every state, only, yeah. only somewhere. Only only couple, somewhere. Right. Yeah. So when I was teaching, I used to give an exam question, which was more important, the 19th Amendment, the oral contraception, Title IX, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, you could give a list. And frankly, of course, yeah. good exam questions, you could write the right answer for any one of them. <laughs> but, um, but the pill is, 
the, the pill touches everybody. Not everybody's going to be a political actor. Not everybody's going to care about equal pay. But in everybody's domestic life, when you have children, how, how that has impact on you. And when women have children is huge. It, it, um, it determines whether or not they complete their education, what kind of job they'll get. It, it mm -hmm. impacts their economic status. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it is the most basic right. And sometimes you'll hear people say, I'm a feminist, but I'm not in favor of abortion rights. And then you want to say, if you're not letting women make choices about their own bodies, how can you be a feminist? How can you think of them as equal socially, politically, and economically? Um, so it really is the core issue. And now, of course, under threat. Well, in this period, too, in the 1960s, I mean, you think of women coming far. Um, but, you know, you, you write about even just in terms of jobs, um, help wanted ads at that time, you know, would specify if it was a male or female applicant that they were looking for. I mean, things that, you know, fast forward now 60 years, but I mean, I don't think people understand that that wasn't that long ago. It is very hard to, um, when you're teaching women's history. Yeah. To anybody except for someone maybe in my generation to understand the lack of rights right. um, pre pre suffrage pre 1920 women and well and even in 1920 so the right to vote did not get you the right to serve on a jury so women lacked personal autonomy to their bodies they didn't own their clothing they didn't control their children they couldn't divorce their husbands they had no property they couldn't inherit property to themselves from their family. They couldn't keep their wages. Their residency was their husband's residency. Their citizenship was their husband's citizenship. There were all kinds of common laws that um, had been translated into statutes that controlled women. And slowly, 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 I mean, the Equal Credit Act is 1974. Or, um, yeah. Takes the, the anti-discrimination, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act is, um, 1978. And those are just little nibbles to try to advance us farther. I, you know, do young people today even think about whose name is on the credit card, that it couldn't have been their name? Well, that, yeah, that you could even get a credit card. Right, right. You couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't. And if you right. did, you had to be a married woman. Mrs. John Deardorff was my first credit card. Um, so things have, there's no doubt that things have improved dramatically and splendidly for a large swath of the American population. But there's a whole bunch of people who were not touched. And you could uh -huh. say that the women's movement will not be successful until every woman benefits from affordable, accessible childcare, from paid family leave, from access to better paying jobs and access to birth control and abortion rights. Um, the chapter that you have titled sort of during this era is, is called uh, Battle Lines. Um, and, and you write, you know, about this kind of post-Vietnam era and sort of the ushering in of more of this kind of radical feminism, the bra burning, that kind of thing. What was the impact of that? And, and what were those kind of battle lines um, like within um, communities of women? Well, it's fascinating that you mentioned bra burning since they never yeah. got a fire permit. They never burned any bras, <laughs> but it was a protest against the Miss America contest in 1968. Um, the 60s were a cauldron in the United States. You had um, the civil rights movement going public and uh, national and much more involvement of white college students and much more news coverage of the violence uh, that was taking place throughout the South. You have the um, heating up of the Vietnam War and in consequence, the anti-war sentiment. And then you have a women's movement sort of stirring around so that mm -hmm. between 68, 70, 72, there's a bunch of people in the street protesting just about everything. And if you were just sort of a normal parent of any of those people who were in the street or grandparent of any of those people who were in the street, you thought they were really unmannerly. You thought that they should stop protesting. You were fed up with anybody else raising a picket sign. And then some things happened that really brought gave you a focal point. Um, passage of the Equal Rights Amendment was generally right. cheered and generally welcomed, but, it, but the way the press played it, that feminists were against homemakers, created a schism. Um, the black-white issue was always going to be um, present and thus 
the civil rights movement that had been pretty racially mixed in the early 60s became uh, with, the, with the rise of black power, um, a lot of women, white women left the civil rights movement to become radical feminists. And you have, again, this diversity of American women. You have women who are wearing jackets, suit jackets and lobbying the Congress. And you have women who are not wearing their bras or shaving their legs and are marching um, against everything to sort of um, destroy the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Then you have Roe. And Roe, um, the Roe decision in January 1973 alarms um, conservative uh, evangelical Christians, conservative Catholics, can anybody who thinks that the country's falling out of control. And it allows Phyllis Schlafly, the third most brilliant strategic female strategist, Carrie Chapman Cat, Martha Griffiths getting the ERA and um, Title VII passed, and then Phyllis Schlafly a conservative who was able to pull together and attract these religious conservatives, Southern segregationists who'd been mad ever since um, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, who had been Democrats, mm -hmm. um, people who just thought the country was falling apart at the seams. And she realigns the political parties in a very effective way. She pulls all those people into a cohort of family values, and she hands them to Ronald Reagan. Um, he almost wins the nomination in 1976. He wins the nomination in 1980. And there is a huge shift in um, American social thinking about equal rights, about civil rights, uh, that has progressed downward, in my opinion, since then. Court appointments, court decisions, right. hard fought leg legislation. Um, so I miss the days when both parties had conservatives and liberals and moderates and they managed to get more done than they do when they are as polarized as they are today. Well, we actually have a question about the ERA and you talked a little bit about Phyllis Schlafly and, and how she succeeded in, in really stalling that. Um, the question is, can you comment on the need to pass the ERA? And I guess, where are we now? And will that, will that ever become uh, an amendment? In the current climate, I doubt it. Today, I think was I think today was the hearing at the court um, of the um, state attorney generals of uh, Virginia, Nevada, and Illinois, saying that the their their state legislative votes ought to count and the and the ERA ought to be ratified. Um, that's not historically accurate. The Equal Rights Amendment, when it was passed by the Congress in March of 1972, by a bipartisan House and Senate. Um, is enormously popular at the time. Um, it, 21 states ratified in 1972 and maybe 12 ratified in the early part of January 73 before, before Roe was handed down. And then partly on account of Phyllis and partly because of this conservative pushback, ratification slows to a dribble. Um, the extension passes narrowly um, and, the, and by June 30th, 1982, we have 35 of 38 states, if you do not count the states that rescinded. So we did not meet the constitutional requirement. And immediately, that was June, the following January, um, the House and the Senate reintroduce a new Equal Rights Amendment, and it has been reintroduced in every congressional session, which sort of makes the case that they thought it was dead in 1982. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 50 years later, you're saying that three more states bring you up to 38. So clearly there's gonna be a lawsuit about that. Is it germane? Is it timely? Um, the Justice Department has said no. Uh, the archivist who now does the certification is trying to not sign it um, because there will be a, a challenge immediately. So I don't, I, don't think the, I don't think the current fight is legitimate because I believe that it did expire. And I don't think a new fight is possible because you have 30 state legislatures controlled both houses by Republicans. It's not wouldn't get ratified and you don't have a bipartisan support in the House or the Senate. And the definition of sex, would you rewrite the language? It's uh, equality of rights uh, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. In the Bostitch case that Neil Gorsuch handed down in the summer of 2020 about a gay man being fired because he played um, by his employer because he played on a gay baseball team. 
he said that that man was covered by Title VII, by sex in Title VII. So the whole issue of how you determine sex, whether it includes LGBTQ or not, would be an issue right. not popular in the Nebraska legislature. Right. So a big hard fight to do it again. Um, but the good thing that happened, also in the language of the first of the ERA of 1972, it said that were it to pass, states had two years to change, get rid of all the discriminatory laws so that they wouldn't be being sued all the time. And most states did that. Virginia, who didn't ratify it during that time period, changed every law. You cannot, it's really hard to find any law that specifically discriminates against women. And you could have found thousands in the 1970s. Right. So then the question is, is it just a constitutional hook? Do you want to have women in the constitution since the word woman does not appear in the constitution <laughs> at present? And you could say yes, so that'd be good. Um, but if the court would consistently use section one of the 14th amendment, equal protection of the law, that does apply to everybody, ought to apply to everybody, but the court has been inconsistent in its application. So it's an excellent question. It's a complicated answer. Right. Um, I love the principle that men and women are equal, all citizens are equal, and ought to be that ought to be stated in the Constitution because that's part of the ongoing advancement of our democracy. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure it's going <coughs> to happen in the short term. And at the moment, I'm more concerned about abortion rights. Yeah. Well, and that pegs into the next question here that we have from Sydney, who's asking, what do you see as the next big frontier for the women's rights movement? <coughs> I think I think we're going backwards and we're having to fight the same fight over again to deal with the Dobbs decision. Um, Justice Alito was wrong when he said um, that abortion is not historically rooted in the nation's history. Mm -hmm. um, Women before before we were a nation, before we were colonies, before while um, indigenous people indigenous people covered the entire continent, women were getting abortions from medicine doctors and um, uh, women in tribes and midwives. Abortion was legal in this country until the mid 19th century, when a big effort by the American Medical Association, feeling threatened by midwives, um, moved to outlaw abortion state by state, and these states that are now like the Arizona law saying, we're gonna to have to enforce this law that was made when we were a territory that outlawed, outlawed abortion. That's when those laws were passed from the 1840s to the 1870s. The Catholic church allowed abortion until the 24th week, what they called insolment into the 1870s. Um, so for most of American history, abortion was available and legal up until what was called quickening when the baby's kicking, but only women knew when the baby was kicking and only women midwives knew what to do about it to quote, restore mm -hmm. menstrual flow. So I think the most urgent issue is reproductive rights. And I think also on a women's agenda should be food deserts, um, mm -hmm. employment issues, education in poorer areas of the country, um, I think there are a lot of ways that we need to improve women's lives to help them um, access uh, all of the benefits of our country that they cannot now. We have um, another question from Roseanne who is asking about um, Latino voters. She said, with all the issues with divisiveness lately and the divide between Latino voters between the two parties, I guess she means both parties trying to court the Latino vote, um, would you say that Latinos, mainly women, are not making any progress today or have we really never been at the forefront of politics until now? Oh, that's a question I may not be qualified to answer. Um, one of the reasons my book focuses mostly on black and white women and Jewish women as an under thing <clears throat> is because for the whole time that I was writing, the whole hundred years, they are players. Clearly, there are immigrant women, there are poor women, there are LGBTQ women, there are um, Hispanic women and Latinas who came at various different times, but they had a voice, they, they developed a voice and a, an a agenda and a, um, later, later in the history of my book. And that's, I think that's still going on. Um, and depending on when people came to this country and under what circumstances, if you were, quote, a wetback in the 1950s or a Cuban refugee, um, who came for different reasons and with different class background, you're going to have different points of view about American politics and where your loyalties lie. I think um, from what I understand from the polling 
that community is divided between the two parties. Um, they have they have different, depending on their personal lives, different backgrounds, different economic class and education have different issues. But I don't think there are very many women voters in any cohort who are not engaged. We're clearly turning out and voting and trying to make our voices heard. Um, I think I think you're seeing that across the board. Well, and, and in the last chapter of your book is entitled Enraged and Empowered, right? 2017 to 2020. Talk about sort of the women's, the women's march after, for example, in, uh, after, in 2021, after Trump was inaugurated, um, you know, more women running for office, um, women seems mo more mobilization, but then yet we've seen over the, maybe that that's tapered off a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts on sort of that enraged and empowered era um, of the last couple of years? Well, I find the entire history of women in America outraging. So I'm pretty much in yeah. the time. It's one of the reasons I think it's fun to study because it just yeah. pumps you up to be an activist. Um, but clearly, so many people expected a different result um, from the um, election of the 2016 right. um, election that that people just went into shock and horror. And I think that was represented in the Women's March. And in every other protest that followed, the National Park Service reported that more people filed, um, more people wanted to have space in Washington to march or protest in the first six months of 2017 than had happened in like the last three decades. Um, uh, Cause there was lots to complain about um, under the Trump administration from my perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the election of 2018, you must have found as well, Betsy, is, is, is exciting. So many women are running. Yeah. Um, women throw themselves um, into the hustings. Um, are, more women are running in primaries. I mean, just every number is an increase. And so you have increases in, in numbers of women elected because it would only work that way. More people try, more people end up um, being elected. Right. Uh, and from and from a much broader diversity of backgrounds and younger women, um, women who campaigned not in their um, suit and uh, uh, blouse, but in but in their um, t-shirt and blue jeans, and brought their children on the campaign trail. Things that I'm possibly your campaign school says is not really advised. You're supposed to quote look like a grown up, but what they look like was real people. Um, right. Who, who could connect with other real people who might have children in tow and no child care. Um, so I'm very encouraged by that. And I think even even as the numbers are going to fluctuate, um, at, frankly, no place to go but up if we're only a third as our highest peak of representation, we need more people running because the whole other issue is whether it's male or female or whatever ethnicity you want to have represented, there's a lot of talent in this country which is not being represented in governing bodies. And so people need to go to their, you know, run for the school board, run for the city council. Um, let your voice be heard because the experience, our country is so diverse and all of those points of view deserve to be represented. And maybe if they're represented by thoughtful people who are willing to communicate and not slug each other, that that might lead to better solutions because we're desperately in need, it seems to me, of better solutions. Well, and this is a similar question here, but someone is asking, how can women best use their hard won rights and power today to continue to make progress? Um, I mean, you oh. talked about running for office and being engaged, um, but what about you know young people who may not want to actually run for office? What, what can they do? Well, I'm, um, of course, having been a teacher for so many years, I'm yeah. very optimistic and proud of young people. They have, think of all the Parkland kids who have really stirred up the um, gun control issue, young yeah. people involved in um, environment and um, climate change issues. I think that the Dobbs decision came as a shock to many women in the childbearing years, sort of 13 to 50, who thought that they had options. Um, and it may come as a shock to them that they're having babies that they didn't intend to have because they can't get the right solution. Um, so I think some women will turn to that kind of grassroots organizing. Grassroots organizing makes a huge difference. You don't have to be running for office. You can be supporting somebody for office or supporting the cause. 
Mm -hmm. It's good to learn how to raise money for your cause early. And it's good to learn to make an argument. And argument is maybe the wrong word. Argument because you want to make your point. But I also think we need more people entering into conversations with people with whom they disagree. Because we've gotten so polarized that we're not having any middle ground. We need to find a way to recreate the middle ground. And I think, I think it exists. I think there are lots of people who are interested in it. The polling is beginning to show that a little bit. The people who are, these women who are registering, this huge bump in registration since June 24th um, are both Republican and Democratic women. And they live in similar um, geography. They're, um, they're, not rural nor urban, they're that in-between ring around cities. Uh, um, their, but their interest is restoring reproductive justice. And do you think that that is that, from what we've seen, that will um, be apparent in the midterm elections? Fingers and toes crossed. Yeah. <laughs> but this polarization that you mentioned, um, it does not seem to be waning at all. Um, what role do you think that the media plays um, in sort of perpetuating this polarization? And then, you know, does also polarization is so off-putting for so many women, I feel, too, that it it actually deters them from getting involved in the political process in many ways? I think that's an issue. And it go, I mean, part of that yeah. is sexual socialization. Part of it is yeah. that Um, the role women have traditionally played in the whole world, the peacemakers, the mediators, the bring people together. Uh, It was one of the reasons that was given for women not engaging in political life. It was too dirty, infighting, shouting, messiness. Um, But women bring skills to that. And we've seen it among the women of the Senate on both uh, the women of the House and the Senate on the occasions when they've come together to create a solution um, to one thing or another. So the divisiveness is real. I don't, I think you could only predict divisiveness in a country as diverse as we are. And I think that diversity is a strength. So we have to figure out a way to channel that strength, to find areas of common ground. And it might be a different, you might have different allies on one fight than you'll have on another fight. Um, And I think understanding that is really important. I think we need to move away from enemies, my (laughs) my team and you guys are the bad guys. Right. And see it as um, allies today, potential allies tomorrow. Uh, a different a different point of view. Well, someone's also asking here along those same lines, what lessons should the modern feminist movement take from the women's rights movement of the past and, and where should it go from here? Thank you for asking that question. The importance of alliance, the importance of, of crossing, uh, crossing these divisions and finding common ground among women who care about the same things, but are working separate paths instead of working together. There's huge strength in alliances. And that means, you know, finding yourself in uncomfortable situations and allowing people to yell at you perhaps while they get over their annoyance with you and then become your ally. I think young people have this huge benefit, at least in some areas of our country where they've grown up with all different kinds of people. And I think if they haven't, they're at a disadvantage for the living in the wider world and finding solutions, because it's not only going to happen with people who look exactly like you. So we need to be open-minded in creating alliances. And we need to think broadly about what the platform issues are um, and have it be more than just what's most important to you. I have great faith in young people and I'm an optimist about the democracy. So I'm hoping it will all come round right but it's certainly messy and loud and scary in the short term. Yeah. Um, I guess before we go, there's a, there's a last question here that what was your most surprising discovery during your research? And I guess I would maybe just peg onto that is, you know, you mentioned so many um, incredible women in history in this book, um, some of whom I, I didn't know much about. Um, can you highlight one or two of them that may, may not be, you know, the household names um, of, of the, the movements that we know um, that are worth people learning more about? Oh, there's so many. I, um, yeah. <laughs> I uh, Septima Clark might be my new heroine um, mm. of Black women. She was the one I knew the least about. 
Septima Clark in the 30s and 40s had been an uh, a African-American school teacher in, in Charleston, South Carolina, segregated schools, poor resources for those schools, highly credentialed woman. She taught um, children during the day, she taught their parents at night. And then she's fired because she's a member of the NAACP, which was illegal in South Carolina. So she is hired by something called the Highlander School in Tennessee, which has been doing labor organizing um, and then decides to expand to a civil rights agenda in the early 50s. Both of those things would be really scary to do in the early 50s. It's out of the Highlander School that We Shall Overcome became a protest song um, because uh, it taught them singing, singing was part of organizing. Mm -hmm. um, so she, she starts what came to be known as the Freedom School Movement, that, that you're teaching people reading and writing, how to register, where to go to vote, how to form a credit union, how to sign a check, how to um, negotiate a lease, all the things that Black women, Black men and women had not been taught um, sort of in their lives growing up because of segregation. Uh, the Highlander School is closed down for being seemingly communist, and she is hired by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And she is the woman who initiates the freedom schools of the 1960s. Under her will be Andy Young, under her will be um, Dorothy Cotton, a whole bunch of people. And that leads to Freedom Summer in 1964. As a result of her work, about 70,000 African-Americans were registered between 1965 and the passage of the Voting Rights Act and 1970, huge accomplishment. Um, yeah. Great ending because she returns to South Carolina and her um, she's elected to the school board and, and sort of honored in her hometown um, after, after all this time in her retirement. Um, but there, I mean, I, I name as many women as I can in this book. I sort of mm -hmm. took up the Black Lives Matter, say his name, say her name, we're naming everyone. Right. Um, right. But there, there are going to be so many people that none of us ever knows the name of, both white women, Black women, every other kind of protesting, reforming woman. And many of us today, who's, we're never going to know the names of these young people who might be making some huge change in our lives. Um, but they're important and we need to acknowledge the work. Uh, and, and when we can credit them, we should give them all honor. Well, the book is just a terrific resource uh, for that as well. It's just for getting a great sort of overview of the last hundred years as it, when it comes to you know, women and equality. Um, and so Betsy, congratulations could, at the end of the book. Thank you, but could we, could we also mention that in addition to political yeah. history and trauma and crisis and danger, yeah. it also includes um, Miss America, Wonder yeah. Woman, Nancy Drew. Um, the Battle uh, of the Sexes, lots, I like that. All of, you know, lots of underwear, lots of fashion, yeah. lots of art. There's, um, I tried to, because there's so many ways that women advance or don't advance separate outside of the political sphere. Absolutely, absolutely. And you you chronicle, you know, all of those touch points and um, yeah, not just politics, but sort of the pop culture um, as well that are that just has ramifications down the line. So uh, it's a lot of it's a fun read too. So congratulations on it. And I you know, really appreciate you taking some time tonight to uh, speak with us more about it. Um, and want to thank everybody for joining us and let me you know we have um, couple more events coming up um, two weeks from now on October 12th. We are gonna have NBC News correspondent Ali Vitali, and she is gonna discuss her new book. It's called Electable, Why America Hasn't Put a Woman in the White House, dot, 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 yet. Uh, so we'll have her here to, uh, to talk about that. Um, and then two weeks after that on the 26th of October, um, we have another terrific AU alum, uh, Dr. Bonnie Morris. Um, she is going to discuss her new book, What's the Score? 25 Years of Teaching Women's Sports History. Mm -hmm. um, and so she'll be here October 26th. And then after the election, we're also going to have a special um, Women on Wednesdays at five o'clock on November 9th to kind of de uh, look at look at the election results, deconstruct them, um, talk to a pollster uh, and some strategists about uh, how women um, fared at the polls um, and midterm elections. So we we'll hope everybody will join us for that. And you can um, sign up on our website and we'll be sending you some emails as well. 
And uh, again, thanks for being here. And uh, thanks again, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'll be watching all of those. Thanks so much. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.